in just a second. There we go. All righty. Let's take our Bibles this morning. Let's turn to the book of Proverbs, please. Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter number 7. I did want to say happy Father's Day to fathers out there and and uh, to those of you have fathers here, give them a call if they're not uh, here with you. And if they're in heaven, uh, I believe you can send a message. And so I ain't got maybe a chapter and verse on that. I think I said that last year. I don't think I have a chapter and verse on that, but I believe it. Amen? And, uh, and so I know mine's in, in glory already there in heaven. Can't wait to, to see him again one of these days. Was with... Uh, breeding some with James and Luke the other day, and, and uh, James said, uh, he's asked, he always asks about Papa Matt, it's this weird situation if you're in that, if you've been in my shoes where I'm at where, you know, your kids didn't get to, to meet your dad, and how much you'd love to them to be able to meet him, and, and uh, he said, uh, you're going to be real happy when you see him one day, Dad, and I said, that's exactly right, I sure am, so praise the Lord, looking forward to that, but I do have a heavenly father, and he knows my name, he knows exactly what I'm going through. And uh, he, he is the perfect example of everything that a father should hope to be and uh, a wonderful example to us. And, and I, I've mentioned before there is a rule that plainly tells us that we have to be very nice to the mothers on Mother's Day and we can be very mean to the fathers on Father's Day. And, uh, and I, I live by that code. I believe that with all my heart. And so, and, and so I do have a Father's Day message. You probably weren't expecting to hear it out of Proverbs 7, and I'll explain why in a little while. I've got a very long introduction. I'm going to go ahead and let you all know up front. A very long introduction. Then we're going to read a whole lot of verses, and then it's going to be a few quick things will be done. All right, so that, that's going to be a little different uh, today. Um, but, and, and, and for the ladies that are upset that they didn't get a Mother's Day message, after you hear the Father's Day message, you'll be very glad that you did not have to get a Mother's Day message, okay? So I think y'all will realize you probably dodged a bullet. So, uh, But anyway, I believe there'll be some, some things in this message that'll be a blessing to everybody who's here, and hopefully there'll be a charge to the men of the church to be the men that God's called us to be, and even to the young men who uh, aren't fathers yet, but you're, you're going to be liable to one day. Uh, maybe God would have something for you as well. And just some introductory comments. I think we would all agree that the very concepts of, of fatherhood and manhood are under attack in our generation. Uh, I mean, it, it is, you, you hear terms like toxic masculinity and things like that, about how, how terrible that it is to, uh, to be a man. And this is nothing new. Uh, this is an ideology that's been around for a long time, but it really began to take hold in our country here in America during around World War II and... Uh, the, 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 the feminist movement and things like that that have taken sway over our country and have really um, influenced our nation in a very negative way. I've quoted here uh, before Gloria Steinem, who's a very popular feminist, who made the statement that a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Uh, and that is to say that they don't. Um, and, and that's kind of the mindset. And that's, that's what our nation and our country and our culture has believed. And what I want to say is I believe the feminist movement uh, under the guise of making everybody equal, that, that's what they say they believe. Everybody needs to be equal. Um, we believe that too. Right? A couple of amens here. We believe that absolutely. Everybody's equal. But under the guise of making everyone equal, they've tried to make everyone the same. Those are two different things. Being equal and being the same. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, it says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. That means, that means equality, right? That means before God, everybody's equal. Uh, the, the, God doesn't hold men up here and, and ladies down here or, or vice versa. Equality means the same degree of dignity and the same degree of value, and we absolutely believe that. However, God did not make us the same. God made men to be men and women to be women, and, and this argument for sameness under the guise of equality, 
This argument for sameness has destroyed uh, traditional gender roles in the home and in the society, right? We have this idea that everyone's the same and therefore everybody should do the same kinds of jobs, uh, that everyone should have the same responsibilities in the home, everyone should have the same responsibilities in the church, rearing children, even fighting wars. Uh, Everybody should be the same. And sadly, I believe it is weak men who have allowed this philosophy to grow and, and, and to take root in our society, men and women are supposed to be different, right? Amen. Uh, Ms. Shreya just took a baby out, right? Uh, that, that's something that women tend to do. If Bo, wherever Zach is, if Bo gets hungry and starts whining, you're not going to take him to the nursing room back there. You say, why not? Because men and women are different. God has equipped a mother to be a mother and a father to be a father And when anybody stands up and says something like that, we're accused of being hateful. Right? We're accused of of being misogynist or or patriarchal or whatever uh, the the homonym that you would like to use. Whatever ad homonym attack that they use, they'll, they'll use them against me. And when Bible preachers, whenever this first started to take root in our society, when Bible preachers stood up and said, hey, that's a slippery slope, we were laughed at. Right? We were laughed at. And then what takes place? Then you have the, 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 the homosexuality movement, right? And the LGBT. That, that is the next logical progression of the argument for sameness. If, if men and women are exactly the same, then the union between a man and a man is exactly the same as the union between a man and a woman. Right? I know it's Pride Month. Is everybody okay? And it seems it seem like you're on edge a little bit. I mean, I'm just telling you what, that, that's the next logical progression. And when, when society tried to tell us that men and women are the same, and the preacher stood up and said, hey, that's a slippery slope, that's going to cause issues, and they laughed at us and said, come on, you guys are just old fogies, get with the times, everybody's the same. And that naturally led to, okay, if everyone's the same, then, then there's nothing wrong with being a homosexual, right? Because... Being a man or a woman, there's nothing distinct about that. Everyone's the same. And then now you have what's taking place in our, uh, an art day, which is the transgender movement, right? And again, that's the next logical progression of the argument for sameness. If men and women are the same, that means the relationship between a man and a man and a woman and a man is the same. And it also means if men and women are the same, then a man can be a woman. And so... That's what's taking place in our society. I even seen something on the news the other day where uh, this person was debating in favor of transgenderism and they made this statement. They said, well, you know, we're all made in the image of God and therefore everyone should have respect. Everyone's made in the image of God and therefore we should respect the, the, the trans movement. What's sad about that is they won't even finish the rest of the verse. The verse that they're referencing Genesis 127, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. That's the rest of the verse. But what they want to do is they want to pick and choose, cherry pick these certain verses to try to make their argument. And and, and that has, has really caused a lot of issues in churches. So much so that preachers would be afraid to stand up in a pulpit and say what I'm saying right now. They'd be terrified to do so. Because they're going to make somebody uncomfortable or someone's going to get mad at them for simply saying what the Bible says. The only answer for this is for the saints of God, people who are genuinely saved, to stand up for the truth of God. That's the only hope for our nation. That's the only hope for our children. Because if you and I are are not allowed to say anything, the only thing our children are going to hear is what the society and the culture is telling them. And we're talking about a world that calls evil good and good evil. And what we need is women who are filled with the Spirit of God. And I believe a Spirit-filled woman will be a feminine woman. And I believe that a Spirit-filled man will be a masculine man. And again, that has nothing to say about equality. I'm talking about the issue of sameness. Things that are different 
are not the same. Simply put. Amen? And so Resurrection Baptist Church is going to be as strong as the individuals and as the families that make it up. I want you to ask yourself this question. How strong is your home? How strong is your home? And if, and I believe this according to the Bible, that the home will only go as far as the husband or the father of that home goes. I believe everything rises and falls on leadership. Right? And the Bible has made clear that a, that a husband or a father is set to be an example and set to be a leader in the home. And so if the home will only go as far as the fathers go, then how far can your family go? How far can my family go for God? They'll go as far as I'll take them. Amen? And this church, again, is, is made up of families and individuals. People in the church make up the church. The church isn't the building, it's the people. And so if you and I uh, refuse to follow God's Word and to obey His commandments, then, then, then we're going to have a weak church as a consequence of having weak homes. And with this all in mind, I want to look at Proverbs chapter 7. And I really just want to get to one verse, one or two verses. But in order to do that, we've got to read the whole chapter, all right? Uh, and so Proverbs 7. And when I announced Proverbs 7, if you're familiar with your Bible, you probably thought, that's very strange. <laughs> that, that's the last passage of Scripture that I would think to, uh, to look at on Father's Day. Because Proverbs 7 is all about the adulterous woman, right? It's about that strange woman. Um, and uh, Matthew Henry said about this chapter, he says, All wise and good men read it as a very melancholy story. The story concludes with sad reflections, enough to make all that read it, not just men, and to make all that read and hear it afraid of the snares of fleshly lusts and careful to keep at the utmost distance from them. So with that in mind, let's, let's start to work our way down through this chapter. First of all, I want to say something about the target or the audience of this, uh, this chapter. Look in verse number 1. Solomon writes and says, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. This, I want you to keep this in mind. This is a father speaking to his son. So this is a good text for Father's Day, right? That's what this is about. It is a father who is speaking to his son uh, pouring out his heart. He doesn't want his son to be destroyed by sin, and he's going to charge him to keep the word of God, right? So verse number two, he says, Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman and from the stranger which flattereth with her words. This is a warning that a, a father would give his, his son. And listen, I'm thankful that I had a father that encouraged me uh, to love the Bible, amen, and to live by the Bible, to live by the truth of the Word of God. And he's basically telling him this. He says, hey, son, if you need a lady in your life, uh, you better have lady wisdom around, Right? He says, you better keep misunderstanding close by. Because if you go out into this world looking for a lady, but you are not first filled with the wisdom of God and the understanding of God's Word, then you're going to wind up in trouble. You young boys listening? I'm telling you, this, the Bible says if you don't have wisdom and understanding and you go out into this world and that woman comes by who flattereth with her tongue, as the Bible says, you're going to be in trouble. Right? So that's the target audience. That's who he's talking about. So this is relevant to any man to, to watch out for this adulterous woman. And it's also relevant to every woman who's here to know, hey, this is not a woman that you want to be. You want to be a Proverbs 31 woman, not a Proverbs 7 woman. And so it teaches us all about the dangers of temptation to sin and how Satan works. So that's the target audience uh, of this um, of this letter, if you will, this, this portion of Scripture. So we see the target. Let's look secondly at the tempted. Verse number 6, Solomon writes and says, For at the window of my house 
I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man, void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner and went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And the text will go on to describe a scene that unfolds uh, on, on a dark street at night. Listen, that's why old timers used to say that nothing good happens after dark. All the parents said amen. Nothing good happens after dark. And what, what he's saying, he's saying, I looked out my window and I see this young man. He's among the simple ones. Uh, I, I can see this young man. He's void of understanding. And then he departs this way and he goes the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And that phrase that he went the way to her house is insinuating that those that are snared by the strange woman are often voluntary subjects. He went the way to her house. He, he was in a place that he should not have been. Right? At a time that he should not have been there. But he's among the simple ones. The charge is, don't be among the simple ones. I heard somebody say the other day that, that you are the product, that everyone is the product of the five closest people to them. I don't have a chapter and verse for that, but that rings true to me. Who you put yourself around, right? Who you spend time with, that's either who you are or that's who you are soon going to be. When God started working in my life, God put me around some different people. Amen? And I'm here today because of the influences that God put in my life. But this young man, he finds himself among the simple ones. He's with all these other guys and they're all void of understanding too. And that puts him in this dangerous situation. This man is young, this man is naive, and he finds himself in trouble. That is the tempted. Let's look at the temptation. Look at verse number 10. It says, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. We see how, how subtle that she is. That word subtle, it means deceitful. It's cunning. Verse 11 says, She is loud. And stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the streets, and life in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, that word impudent, it means shameless and defiant. We see how, how shameless that she is. She says in verse 14, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. She's going to convince him of how spiritual that she is. Isn't that amazing? She, she's in the process of committing adultery, and yet she's going to try to convince him of how spiritual that she is. I got all my peace. I paid my tithes. I gave the missions this week. I'm so spiritual. Verse 15, she says, Therefore came I forth to meet thee. I hope everybody's listening to this, especially the men in the church. She says, therefore came I forth to meet thee and to seek thy face, and I have found thee. You know what she's doing? She's telling him how special that he is. She says, I found you. I was looking for your face. She's trying to make him feel special. She says in verse 16, I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love unto the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. That is her temptation. And it includes a lot of things. It includes the attire of an harlot, we see her, her attitude, her appeal, her ambitions, all these things are, are describing the way in which she tempts this man. And then lastly, in verse 21, we see the tragedy. Verse 21 says, With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. I wonder how many families have been destroyed because of somebody flattering someone that they had no business flattering. 
You shouldn't be trying to flatter anybody but your spouse. Right? But we have, we have this, this adulterous woman, and, and she's, she's trying to flatter somebody and to impress someone and to make somebody feel special that she had no business even speaking to. Especially not on a dark street in the middle of the night. Are you with me? I know this isn't a Sunday morning text. I hope y'all will hold on, all right? Verse number 22 says, He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver. I believe that's, that's referencing how suddenly his life is ruined in this moment. Listen, man, it only takes one moment. You could spend a lifetime building up a, a reputation, if you will, or a testimony, and you can lose that testimony in a moment. Describes it as a dart striking in his liver, just something so quick because of this, uh, this plea, this, this woman. It goes on to say in verse 23, As a bird hasteneth to the snare, and knoweth not, that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Think about this. He, 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 in verse number 1, he talks about my son. Now he's saying, hearken unto me, children. This is a conversation that I could imagine a father having with a son, right? With a child. This isn't a passage of Scripture you need to wait till you're an adult to know something about. Are you with me? This is something that, that fathers should talk to sons about. Describing this scene. It says, Hearken unto me now, therefore, verse 24, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. He says, Let not thine heart decline to her ways, and go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. That is the tragedy, verse 21 through 27, the tragedy of a life that is ruined by seduction to sin. And you might be wondering, well, why in the world are we reading this on, on Father's Day? There's a couple reasons. One would be, I am absolutely sick and tired of hearing about homes and families that are torn apart because of adultery. Aren't you? I'm sick and tired of hearing about it. Friends, pastors even, people that, that you might would look up to and that you would respect. And by the way, it's not an affair. It's adultery. It's not a mistake. Are you with me? You don't say, well, I, I fell into it. No, no, you jumped into it, is what you did. I'm sick and tired of hearing about that. And what we need is strong families with a husband and wife who love each other the way they're supposed to. Amen? That's what will make the church what it needs to be. That'll make our, that's what will make our homes the way that they need to be. Is strong families that are insulated from, from this kind of temptation. And so we and we live in a world that, that completely makes light of that, acts like it's not that big of a deal. I think this needs to be preached on more, not less. I think it needs to be preached on a whole lot more. Young people who are who are led into a life of sin because of fornication. By the way, that's anything outside of marriage between a man and a woman. It's fornication. It's a sin. We live in a society of libertines, encouraging everybody to, to live a life of, of hedonism and pleasure, just do whatever feels good, do whatever you want, instead of a life of holiness and purity. That's what we need to be advocating for. That's what we need to be teaching to our children. Holiness and purity. Living a life of godliness. Living a life by the Bible. Amen? And, and looking out for these Temptations. So that's one reason why. The second reason why is I believe that there's someone in this passage 
in this story that is, that is always overlooked. When, when you read Proverbs 7, and I said it earlier, and everybody said amen, I said Proverbs 7 is about the strange woman. Everybody says amen, and that's, that's true. But there's somebody else in this story that, 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 is, that is always overlooked and is never talked about, but I believe plays a central role to what happens in this scene. And he's found in verse number 19. I want everybody to look at verse number 19, Proverbs chapter 7. She says this. She says, The good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. Every time the story is mentioned, it always speaks about the ungodly woman. But I believe that there is an absent husband in this passage of Scripture, that, that is the reason why this scene is even in the Bible, or why this scene unfolds. I spoke earlier about the God-given roles. That's why I took my time in my introduction. I talked a minute about the God-given roles of men and women in the home, and I believe that these roles are complementary. Again, we believe in equality, but we do not believe in sameness. Meaning if a man is what a man's supposed to be and what a woman is what a woman is supposed to be, that they complement one another. They don't contradict one another. Right? They don't, they don't, they're not in contrast to one another. They complement each other. This whole woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. That's foolish. And men need women too. All the men said amen. All the fathers and the husbands, you said Amen. I mean, we're a mess without them, right? God looked at Adam by himself. That's the first thing in your Bible that, that, that he says is not good. God created everything, said that it was good, and then he looks at a man without a woman, and he says, yeah, that's not good. We need to fix this, right? We, we, need, we, need, to, we need to add a little something here. And then the last thing that God created was a woman. It is lit... She is literally the crowning of creation. All the men said amen. amen. That's what a woman is. The last thing that God created. And so we understand that. But we also understand that there are supposed to be roles within that home. Ephesians chapter 5 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, the church, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that their wives be to their own husbands in everything. That's the wife's defined role. And then the husband has a defined role. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. A husband, a man, is one who sacrifices. Right? Jesus sacrificed himself for you. That's what he's talking about. He's making that analogy or that comparison. So as Christ gave himself for the church... A husband ought to give himself for his wife. He says that, why? Why? What, what, this is a part of the defined role of husbands. This is not talked about like it should be. Verse 26 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That further defines and describes the role of a husband and a father within a home. It has to do with promoting holiness, right? And sanctification in the home. That's what Jesus does for us. He died for us to take away our sin, but the Bible goes on to say that, that He did that, that He might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the Word. That, that's what a husband's supposed to do, to be a godly influence in the home. I believe that God has called the husband to be the priest and the leader of that home the spiritual leader of the home, to provide guidance, direction. Again, the home will go as far as the man will allow it to go. By the way, that works if the wife is going to follow as she's supposed to. Just north-south, just kind of nod your head. We talked about the defined roles and how they're complementary. But if there's something wrong on either side, it, it's, it's not going to work like it should. Right? 
And so again, it takes a, a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, both to be filled with the Spirit of God in order to accomplish this, uh, this picture. And so with this in mind, I want to preach this morning. I know I've been preaching for 30 minutes. I'm giving my title. I'm almost done. I want to preach on the good man is not at home. The good man is not at home. Just a few quick things. Four quick failures by the good man or the good man in this home. Verse number 19, first of all, I see the absence of this good man. It says in verse number 19, it begins with that phrase, for the good man is not at home. I believe that the spiritual state of the Proverbs 7 woman that everybody likes to pile on and talk about, I believe that the spiritual state of this Proverbs 7 woman is because there's a Proverbs 7 husband who's absent from the home. She has an absentee husband. I believe our entire nation is suffering the effects of fatherlessness. That's why the prisons are full. That's why the methadone clinics are overrun. That, that's why there's drugs and crime and domestic abuse. I believe all that stems from fatherlessness in the home. Right? Are you with me? It is absentee fathers and husbands who aren't doing what they're supposed to do. There are more children born out of wedlock now in our country than there have ever been. They are deadbeat dads that won't support their children, often leaving mothers. By the way, men and women are different. Right? Therefore, when, when, when a woman gets pregnant, uh, I, I think a man should realize that, that you're equal but not the same, and there should be a responsibility on that man to stay present in that child's life. Amen? It's, a, it's easier for the father to abandon naturally, obviously, than the woman. But that man should understand that there should be equality even though there's not sameness and don't be an absentee father. And yet we have that in our nation and that has become a scourge that has worsen, worsened and it has really had a lot of negative effects. And even, sadly, we have th those are the ones that are obvious. If they're not present, they're not there. But sadly, I think we've got a whole lot more dads, even ones in the church, who may be physically present, but they're spiritually absent. They're morally absent. Meaning they're not leading their families toward God. They're not teaching morality and values to their children. They provide no spiritual growth, no moral guidance, no quality time. Just absent. Just not where they're supposed to be. Right? I'm thankful I had a dad that was present with me. And you may not have. And, and, and God help you with that. And God can help you. And we have a Heavenly Father who's never absent. Praise the Lord. But I had one that was present with me. I worked together, went to church together, hunted together, did, did all kinds of things together. And, and, I'm, and I was greatly benefited by that. Proverbs 7, we look back in verse number 11. In verse number 11, we read that this Proverbs 7 woman, she's loud and she's stubborn. And the Bible says that her feet abide not in her house. Her, her feet abide not in her house. That's where her feet are supposed to be, but they're not there. Right? It says, now she's without. Now in the streets. She lieth and wait at every corner. You say, well, why is she absent? Because he's absent. Amen. That's why she's absent. You say, well, why, why do her feet abide not in her house? Because his feet don't abide in her house. There's an absentee father who's bringing this about. I heard a message one time where a preacher got up and he preached out of Exodus chapter number 24 where God tells Moses, he says, to come up unto me into the mount and be there. And he preached out of that text, and he preached on when you get there, be there. Meaning it's not enough just to physically be there. Right? You have to be intentionally there. Not, not living on your cell phone. Kids need more than that. Right? 
I mean actually be present with, with, with your wife or with your husband, if you're, if you're a wife, with your children. Actually be present. Emotionally, spiritually, mentally, intentionally. And sadly, many homes suffer the consequence of an absentee father. So one issue is absence. One issue would be distance. Look at our verse again, verse 19. He says, for the good man is not at home. It says, he is gone a long journey. The distance there. Y'all know last week I got back from England. I was over there for nine days. I was away from my family. I think the kids enjoy it when I leave, to be honest with you. Sometimes uh, Kristen lets them eat junk food and stay up late and watch movies and hang out and they, they have a good time when I'm, when I'm not there. She's trying to distract them. I do not have a good time when I'm not there. I, I want to be, be with my family. And it wasn't just the fact that I wasn't there. It was how far away that I was. We're talking over 4,000 miles away. That's different than just being at the job down the road. You can, you can be back at the house in a minute if you needed to. That wasn't the case. And so the, the distance brought that about. And I, and I hate being gone, and I, I was ready at the end of that, I was ready to erase the distance, to get back to where I needed to be. And yet sadly, some husbands, some wives, some children, even though they, they sleep under the same roof, maybe, maybe they're sitting in the same pew this morning, there's still some distance there. Are you with me? You husbands, wives, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, just every now and again, so, somebody's not right with the Lord, somebody's not right with their spouse, and there's just this distance that grows. Listen, we, we don't need that. The distance, when there's distance in your relationships with your family, that is an opportunity for Satan to have a foothold in your life. And the distance between this Proverbs 7 man and this Proverbs 7 woman is what made the whole situation what it was. If he hadn't have been absent, if he hadn't have been distant, it wouldn't have turned out that way. Amen? Notice, it, it calls it a long journey. A long journey. Listen, if it takes you a while to get there, it's going to take you a while to get back. That's so why we've got to be careful about the distance. Brother Dean McNeese preaches a message out of Genesis chapter 3 about where the, the serpent comes to deceive Eve. And, and the title of his message is this, Where Was Adam? You ever thought that? Read Genesis 3 and the, that subtle serpent is, is deceiving Eve. A good question is, where was Adam? Where was the husband? He was distant. And he wasn't where he needed to be. See the absence, the distance. Thirdly, we see the substance. Look in verse number 20. It begins with, it says, He hath taken a bag of money with him. That's substance. That's took that bag of money. Now, it doesn't say what he took the money for, what the purpose was. I don't know if he's on a hunting trip. Uh, he's at Bass Pro Shop. He's going to lose all of that money. I know all about that. Um, I, I'm not sure, sure where he was. I, I think most would read this text and, and come away with the idea that he's probably on business. Right? It's a business trip. He's gone on a long journey. He's not at home. And he's conducting business. While, while his family is, is, is following after Satan and is being destroyed. I think we've got an issue with a lot of dads who, who are more faithful to their jobs than they are to their family. Maybe I'm just preaching to myself today. But I, I think this is a message we need to hear. Right? More consumed with substance. More consumed with uh, material things. Care more about having you know, an extra dollar in your pocket than, than spending time with your family. Matthew chapter 6 says that no man can serve two masters, right? For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, a man needs to take care of his family, right? Talk about traditional gender roles. I believe that. 1 Timothy 5 verse number 8 says, But if any provide not for his own 
and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And if he's not taking care of his family, then the Bible says he's worse than an infidel. If any man not provide not for his own. But what I want us to understand is that providing for your family has more to do than money. Because families need more than money. Children need more than money. A wife needs more than money. By the way, he apparently had left enough money with this woman for her to take care of herself. And he probably thought, well, then I've done my job. What did she tell the man? She said, I I have my peace offerings with me. I've paid my vows. Right? She said, I paid my vows. He talks about all the the, the carved works and the the fine linen of Egypt and all, all of the material things. But that does not mean that she was provided for. Because it's not enough. The one, uh, th- this is one thing, one of those things that is so foolish about our society is the incentive structures that, that, our, that our society has built. You know, women, there, there are women today who, who will refuse to get married because if, they were to, if there was a man in the home, then they wouldn't get a check from the government. And, and, and what our society has advocated for is for people to marry the government to get, to get a check. And, and, and they think, that's going to be what's best for my family. No, you need more than a check. That child needs more than a check. They need a dad. Right? They need a dad. They need, they need a man at home. Uh, not just a check. Not just a roof over their head. Now they need a roof over their head. But my goodness, is there not more to being a dad than that? It's more than substance. It's more than cars and toys and 401ks. It's, it, it's way more than that. We see the absence and the distance. Lastly, we see the substance. Oh, we've seen the substance, then lastly, the, the frequency. Verse number 20 says, He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. I say frequency because the way with which she speaks, she says, and he will come home at the day appointed. What that tells me is he's done this before. Right? Do y'all see that? When she says he'll come home at the day appointed, what she's saying is, yeah, that's what he did last time. And the day before that. The time before that, the time before that, just just gotten used to having a good man that's not at home. I I, I want to be present for my family, don't you? I, I want to be. Listen, I've got a God that's very present. I've got a God that has never left me alone. He's provided for me in more ways than financially. He's provided for me and met every need that I have. He's faithful to me. He's not distant. He's nearby when I need Him. Aren't you glad for that? When you need to pray, you don't have to try to hunt Him down. He's present. He's there. He's promised never to leave us nor forsake us. What a wonderful example that our God is as to what kind of fathers that we should strive to be. Friday night I was at home and... um, I had to go get something out of my truck, and uh, Maddie and, and Luke asked if they could go with me. I said, sure, and so we're walking across my driveway, and I am tender-footed. I'm very tender-footed. So I'm, I'm sitting there walking really slowly over my, uh, the, the asphalt there in my driveway, and Maddie, she comes by, and she grabs my hand, and we're holding hands walking under my truck, and she says, out of nowhere, she says, sometimes I'm scared of the dark. I said, that's an interesting statement. I said, well... I said, well, when are you not scared of the dark? And she said, I'm not right now. And you know why? It's because she, she had my hand. Right? Because there, because there was a dad that was, that was, at, that was present, that, that was not distant, and was close by, and, and she knew if anything were to happen, that, that, there, that there's a dad that's there. And listen, I've got a God who's like that. Amen. He's always there. He's he's present in my life. 
He's there to help. He's there to guide. He's there to protect. And my prayer is that God will help me to be the same way. Amen? My prayer is that God will touch the fathers, help us to, to provide and to, to protect and to be what God's called us to be. Let's all thank God for the fathers that He gave us on this Father's Day. And then for, for all of us in this passage of Scripture, we need to realize the temptation of sin and how quickly it could all be taken away from you. That testimony that you've built. Let's ask for God to help us. Miss Alicia, if you'll move towards the piano.